Greetings, citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful, creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this, all this that we have going on in this world today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy, crazy planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing the murder of 22 year old Malaysia Booker. Malaysia Booker was a transgender woman who was violently assaulted in 2019. And this assault was videotaped and went viral on the internet. So Malaysia, she survived this mob style attack, which was just horrifying. We're going to get into that. And then she went on to be found dead face down in the streets of Dallas one month later. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of, us. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They're all Bratterstein, but no pressure. So guess what guys, today's video, is sponsored by Dossier. If you are not familiar with Dossier, which if you've been here before, you definitely are. Um, but if you're not familiar with Dossier, you're about to get familiar with Dossier. Dossier is a fragrance company that creates luxury scents, but at a fraction of the luxury price tag, where most luxury perfumes can cost anywhere from 50 to um, hundreds of dollars. As I always say, how dare they? Dossier's perfumes range from $29 to $49, and they offer bulk deals with up to 25% off and also free shipping for three or more bottles, which is a deal that I know sounds too good to be true, but I promise it's not. This is real life right now. Okay, the first scent I got to share with you guys is Aquatic Peony. And you can already smell it in the box. And it's inspired, I can't, I know what it's called, but I can't pronounce these words. It's inspired by Giorgio Armani, Aqua di Gioia. A day perfume. <laughs> um, I'm not a cosmopolitan, you know what I mean? But even though I'm not a cosmopolitan, when I say that this scent takes me somewhere, it smells like fresh, but pretty. It's really hard to explain. Basically, it smells like a rich person would be wearing this perfume. That's the vibe that I get from this scent. And the other one I got is one that I've gotten before. I've gotten it once, I've gotten it twice. I've gotten it a hundred times. It is citrus green apple, and it is inspired by Dolce & Gabbana's light blue perfume. And this one just, I, it's, if you know, you know. The girls who know, the girls who, what do the kids say? The girls who get it, get it, and the, go, the girls who don't, don't. But yeah, this one's just great. This is what my mom, this is my mom's favorite perfume. This is my little sister's favorite perfume. This just seems to be a fan favorite across the board. So if you haven't tried this scent, you might want to get on it because everybody's wearing it. See. And the best part of Dossier for me personally is that they are a cruelty-free fragrance brand and neither Armani nor Dolce, Dolce and Gabbana, Dolce and Gabbana, Dolce and Gabbana are. So if you've ever wanted to try their scents, but you love animals as much as I do, and you don't want to see them tested on, you can go ahead and try Dossier because they smell the same. They are cruelty-free and they are a fraction of the price, which I know is a huge selling point for most people, me included, as a, um, a woman in a lower tax bracket than somebody who shops um, at Armani. <laughs> Let's just say that. Anyways, guys, Dossier is offering members of the Brat Pack 10% off of their favorite new perfume with the code Bratterstein at checkout. And with that, plus the bulk deals that you can get and the free shipping and all that jazz, I cannot imagine that you're going to find a better deal out there. I think this is like as good as it gets. And that's pretty um, darned good. Rootin' tootin' good, cowboys. Mm. Anyway, uh, if this all sounds good to you, please don't forget to click the link in my description box and use the code Bratterstein at checkout to get 10% off your new favorite perfume today. And I just want to say a thank you to Dossier for sponsoring this video and a thank you to you guys for always being so cool and supportive of all my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. Okay, now that I'm done spreading the good word of Dossier, we can go ahead and get into this video. Now this is a video on a case that was suggested to me by a subscriber. It's a subscriber suggestion case, and it was suggested by Sienna. Hi, Sienna. Thank you, Sienna, for the actual heartbreak, because this case, it hit me right in the heart. 
I have mentioned before on this channel that there are certain cases that hit me a little bit harder than others, and those are usually ones of marginalized people hate crimes and crimes against kids. Those ones just hit me a little different for some reason. Every murder is obviously sad, but those ones just get under my skin. Um, and this one was no different in looking into. And as I started to look into this case, it was actually a little bit difficult to, to put the video together on this case. I looked on uh, YouTube and I didn't see many videos on her story because um, I always look to see if there are a lot of videos. Not that I wouldn't do a video on one that there are a lot of videos on, but I do like to try to cover cases that have gotten less coverage and this falls under that umbrella for sure because there weren't a lot of videos and just getting information on her case I found to be difficult in general. I'm not sure why that was, um, but I was finding it hard to find a lot of credible information and um, I really didn't know, I wasn't certain if I would be able to get enough information to put a video together and then it's like I hit a gold mine and I found this one article that had links to all these other places and when I say that this case was like a roller coaster, it was more twists than, what is it, more twists than Lumbar Street in San Francisco, it was crazy. It went from this one woman's tragic murder, Malaysia's murder, to her killer being charged with three murders and being suspected of being a serial killer who was targeting black transgender women. So I'm going to tell you all about it today. And while I do, I'm going to be putting on a full face of makeup, hence the makeup in morbid makeup. Now, if that's not really your thing, that's cool. Thanks for hanging out this long. I hope you can find a channel that covers this case in a way that you enjoy. But if you're not sure how you feel and you're kind of on the fence, maybe stick around. I think you could be surprised by how much you like it. If you're ever curious as to what makeup I'm using, it will be listed down in the description box. And when I get to the end of this video, I want you to hear everything that I say today. And I want you to answer me a question of the day at the end. And I want to know what you think the motive for Malaysia's murder was. Okay, now that I've said all the things that I need to say. Come, gather around, and let me tell you the story of the tragic murder of 22-year-old Malaysia Booker. Now, before we get into exactly what happened to Malaysia, I want to get into who Malaysia was as a person, and I did find this to be difficult. I put it together as best as I could, but there really isn't a lot of information out there on who she was as a person, who she was as a kid, her friends, her family, all of that. Um, I feel like I got a few key points I'm able to put together a, a little bit of a picture of her, but it's definitely not super comprehensive, which if you've been here before, you know that I prefer to be able to really humanize the people we talk about because they are actual people. They're not just stories for entertainment. They are um, human beings who are tragically killed. I did see an episode of a show called MTV's True Life Crime on Malaysia's case, which I didn't even know that MTV was doing true crime cases now. Uh, but apparently they are. And I watched this episode. I actually had to pay for it. Like you couldn't just watch it. So I paid for this episode and I watched it and it did include some interviews with friends and family in Malaysia. So I was able to put a little bit of a picture together and I'm going to do my best here now. Malaysia Booker was born in South Dallas on January 14th, 1997. And she was the second born child to her mother, Shantae. And her father's name is Pierre. And just for the record, in some reportings, I see her mother's name as Shantae and some she's named Stephanie but I believe her name's actually Shantae. But anyways, Malaysia was described as a ball of energy, just filled with life as a child. She loved school and was considered the class clown, but as she got older, she had to deal with a lot of bullying in her life. She did her best to stay strong, or at least seem strong in the face of any ridicule she received, but she was described as a jelly bean, hard on the outside and soft on the inside. Malaysia was described by her friend Jessica as just like, the best person, the best friend, a person with a quote, heart of gold. She said that Malaysia was not, she didn't want to experience all the tragedy that she had experienced in her life, literally up until the last minute of her life. But she was okay with taking the punches because she wanted people to pay attention to the injustices against people like her in the world. Jessica said that Malaysia was the type of friend who would encourage her the type of friend who would get dressed up with her and go take photos downtown because she wasn't able to go to her prom and the type of person who literally walked miles in the Texas heat to sit next to her at her father's funeral. Malaysia was a good friend. As Malaysia got older and started to come to terms with who she really was, she found it difficult to express this openly with all of her friends and with her family and to at the same time feel totally accepted for who she was. And Malaysia was the type of person who was totally unapologetic about being transgender and totally just open. She was very open about who she was as she should have been. Like I 
I'm very much of the mind of like be who you are and be who you are openly and loudly like that. I, I can't um, put myself in the position that she was in because I am not a black transgender woman. You know what I mean? So I can't really understand what that feels like. And I'm sure that there's a lot of challenges that come with that. We see in the world that there must be, but she didn't give a shit. And she was like, this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. And this was hard on her family. Um, at the time that she was killed, her and her mother were actually not speaking. Um, her mother was finding it very difficult to accept that her baby was a transgender woman. Malaysia came out to her mother at the age of 19 and it was so bad at one point that her and her mom got into a fight and her mom told her that if she was to die first, that if Malaysia was to die before her mother did, that she would cut off all her hair and dress her as a man. And I know that's tough to hear. And I'm sure it's tough for her to know, like her, her mother, it's tough for her to know that she had said that in hindsight. Um, but she said that she has come to honor her daughter's truth because of how hard she fought to be herself and because of the fact that she literally paid the ultimate price just to be who she really was. Later in hindsight, which is always 2020, it's always easier to put things into perspective after you can see a full picture. But either way, after everything happened, her mother described her as courageous. And she said specifically of her daughter's courage and her daughter's journey to be who she really was. And I quote, she was willing to die behind it. That's why it's well with my soul. So in her adult years, Malaysia started to branch out, started to look for a community of people, new friends, people who were more like her in a position that she was, people that could relate better to the experience that she was having. And she did find these people and she found a bunch of new friends and she, they were basically sort of like a family and she referred to them as her gay family. And it's funny, I don't know if it's funny, it's interesting. It's noteworthy. It's something I'm going to say now. But when I was uh, younger, when I was a teenager, I actually knew a family just like this. It was a group of my friends that lived there and they were all, it was a combination of transgender women and drag queens. So everybody didn't identify um, as transgender in that home. And they literally painted like Barbies on the outside of the house because the house mama, um, he had painted the Barbies on the outside of the house because at one point he and his boyfriend, it's a really sad story. There had been a, a bashing and his partner didn't make it. And, and he said that he was never going to, um, suppress who he was. He was going to be unapologetically himself. And that's why he decided to paint Barbies on the outside of his house. Like, Hey, I'm here, get used to it. Like, what are you going to do about it? But anyways, it was just like such a fun house. It was a house. Everybody lived together. They had frequent parties and it was the most welcoming environment you could ever be in in your life. There was John Anthony, the house mama, and there was a house papa. And they literally welcomed in any person who needed a place to stay. Anybody who felt unloved, unwelcome, unwanted, anyone who just needed help, like getting through their lives, being who they were, they let in with open arms. And it was like the best group of people. They would just bring everyone in and make them feel protected and accepted. And this is what Malaysia found in her new group of friends. This family helped her feel very safe, accepted, secure. She felt very elevated and was honestly really happy and feeling free, especially by her, uh, her gay dads, which she had a few. Malaysia was the type of girl who wanted to be well-known, wanted to be famous, wanted to be a celebrity. She wanted to do broadcast journalism. She just didn't want an ordinary life. So she started building up a quote fan base on the internet. I believe Facebook was her um, platform of choice and she would do frequent like live chats on there and she called them Malaysia's live room and she would just get on there all the time and talk about her life, her experiences, her day to day, just everything that was Malaysia and people really seemed to like her and she ended up with a um, following of like 20,000 followers on Facebook. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit to May 18th, 2019 at about 6.40 a.m. when police receive a call and they're dispatched to an area, an isolated street near a golf course, and they were sent out there because there were reports of gunshots. As they arrived to this really secluded area, it was an area tucked away on a street that didn't really have any street lights. It was pretty isolated. It was a street that at this time of day, in the middle of the night, it would not be well-traveled, right? And when they got there, they found 22-year-old Malaysia Booker lying face down in the street. She had been shot to death. 
It was later determined that Malaysia had been shot somewhere between the hours of 3 a.m. and 3.45, so why they didn't get there till three hours later to, um, to recover her body, I really couldn't tell you, uh, but that is what happened. And when police arrived, Malaysia was found without any identification on her. She didn't have an ID. Uh, I'm joking. In addition to not having her ID, her cell phone was missing, so they weren't initially able to make an identification on her. Malaysia was transported to the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office, and it was there that the medical examiner was able to determine that this was, in fact, Malaysia Booker. And the next day, police released a press conference um, informing the public that Malaysia had died. Now, Malaysia Booker was a name that, at the time that she was killed, was well-known to police and was well-known to the community where she lived as a whole. Malaysia was a sort of local celebrity, for lack of a better wor word, and not because of her large following on social media. Malaysia's name and face were well known because just a month before she was killed, she, her name, her face had been circulating all over the internet, all over major news media, like everywhere. And that's because a month before she was murdered, Malaysia had been attacked in a very aggressive mob style attack, an attack that was being investigated as a hate crime at the time that she was killed. And this entire attack was filmed by somebody present and the video went viral on social media. Now, what happened that day is that Malaysia had been visiting a friend at the Royal Crest apartment complex and they had, you know, finished hanging out and Malaysia was going to leave. As she went to leave, she backed her vehicle into another car. And it was at this point that Malaysia made like a bad judgment call. She assessed the situation and thought the damage wasn't that bad. So she decided that she was gonna just leave and she tried to leave the scene of the accident. Obviously that's not something that one wants to do. It's not a good thing to do, but it definitely does not merit what happened to her next. This car then chased Malaysia as she drove away and slammed their car into the back of her car, trying to run her off the road to stop her from leaving. It was at this point that Malaysia did stop and she got out of the car. Um, and she got out of the car because the person who was driving the car that she hit pulled a gun on her and, you know, forced her out of the car and was basically like, you're not going anywhere until you pay for the damages to my car. Now, as this happened, a scene started to form. People started coming outside very nosy to see what was happening because there's a car accident, two car accidents, and now somebody's got a gun. And at this point, Malaysia gets out of her car and she sees this mob, of, like this crowd of people start to form. And she starts walking in the street and kind of yelling. And what's super fucked up is that later, the attorney for the primary aggressor, the man who um, attacked Malaysia this day, the attorney for this person tried to say that Malaysia had instigated the attack on her by like walking in the street and yelling at all the people. And I'm kind of like, so this woman who's alone, who's got a gun pulled on her, is yelling at a group of people who are watching this go down and doing nothing. And somehow that means that she asked for the beating that she got. And I'm just like, in what world? Like put yourself in that situation. You're a woman who's standing there surrounded by a group of people who are just watching this person pull a gun on you and no one's doing anything. And you're yelling at them for not doing anything. And the attorney's like, well, that that's your fault for yelling at them. I, I don't know. That just sounds, I know it's his job to defend this person, but like, come on, man, come on. Now, as the crowd becomes increasingly more hostile and there were so many people, mind you, so this is a huge crowd that's starting to get hostile. And if you want to see the video, I'm not going to post clips here. People get mad at me for not doing that, but like, sorry, I'm not going to. If you want to see the video, you're welcome to look it up on YouTube. There's plenty of footage of it. And you can see in the video, there are so many people. They're like lining the streets all over the, the sidewalk on the corner. There's so many people and they're getting more and more hostile. And it's at this point, it's being reported that somebody in the crowd asks another man in the crowd says, Hey, I'll give you 200 bucks to beat the shit out of her. This person uses less um, respectful language when saying this, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but the guy who was asked was like, hell yeah, I'll absolutely do that. And he's seen on a pair of gloves and approaching Malaysia. He then grabs her, throws her to the ground and just begins beating the shit out of her. 
he punches her over and over and over. And while she's laying on the ground, she does her best to protect herself, to protect her face, to protect her head. And this is when like mob mentality started to kick in for the people watching. So once the fight began, once he grabbed her to, and threw her to the ground, everybody kind of ran over and got closer, you know, fight, 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 and like surrounded the two. So it was like a really close little, you can imagine it, right? And it was at this point that people on the sidelines, people that were watching started to take part in beating Malaysia as well and started to kick her and stomp on her. She was able at one point to kind of get herself up and stagger away, but the man who was beating her followed her, knocked her back to the ground and proceeded to kick her. Like he wouldn't let her remove herself from the situation. It was just like, I cannot even imagine how horrifying being in that position was. He threw her to the ground again. He started to punch her. He started to kick her. He started to grab her and drag her all across the concrete. And she's like wearing little shorts and a tank top. So I can't even imagine like the road rash that happened with this whole, uh, it's just, Malaysia was apparently beaten into unconsciousness with fists, feet, and even a brick while the crowd looked on and yelled homophobic slurs at her while she was being beaten. I'm going to tell you a couple of quotes um, that it was reported that people were saying. I'm going to not say certain words and you can kind of put two and two together because they're horrible, but people said things like, quote, that's what your F ass gets. Get that F out of our hood and shoot that punk ass. Now, I just want to stop here for a second and have you kind of put yourself in that position for a second. You are yelling in the street. You have a gun pulled on you. This crowd starts moving in on you of all these people. Then out of nowhere, this huge dude, I read that he was like six, seven, grabs you and starts beating the shit out of you while all of these people who are watching do nothing. And then it gets worse. It's not that they do nothing. It's that some of them start beating you as well. What the fuck? And then later for the attorney, for the guy that's beating her to literally say that she asked for this, that she brought this on, it's mind boggling. Cause I put myself in that situation and I'm like, I can totally see why she started yelling and stuff. It's kind of like when you're in the woods and you run into like a bear or some other dangerous animal and you make yourself big to try to scare them from attacking you. That's what I picture her doing. And then this happens to her. This attack only ended up stopping when a group of women intervened. They went and they grabbed Malaysia, who at this point in the video, you can see her body's like limp. She's not in good shape. And they drag her to a nearby car to take her to safety when she's taken to the hospital. And in the hospital, she's treated for her injuries, which included a concussion, a fractured wrist and facial fractures. So Malaysia reported the assault to the police, obviously. And she did this while she was in the hospital. And for some reason, even though this assault happened like midday on that Friday, like the sun's really bright in the sky, you can clearly see that in the video. Police don't actually interview her till 1130 that night. And I'm not really sure why, but that note stood out to me. Like, why would it take so long? But anyway, she tells police about what happened to her, about the attack. She tells police that she knows who the guy is who attacked her. And she tells police all about all of the homophobic and transphobic slurs that were said to her during her attack. Now, as I said, this entire attack was recorded and the footage got into the hands of a person who described themselves as a blogger and an LGBTQ advocate. And they weren't really clear on whether or not they recorded the video or if they got different um, footage and spliced it together to make a full video, but they released this onto social media. And they said that the reason that they did this was because there needed to be accountability for those who attacked Malaysia, but they also wanted to shed light on how much violence there was towards transgender human beings. This video went on to go super viral. It got millions of views. It was being shared everywhere. It ended up on major news outlets. People were seeing this and they were blown away just because of the sheer brutality that you see in this video. And you, and the fact that you see all of these people standing by doing nothing, the indifference of good men, as they say in boondock saints, when they're talking about the Kitty Genovese case, they called it hate based, shocking, disturbing, brutal, and they were just blown away at the just sheer number of people who were able to stand by it and do nothing to help. The Dallas police lieutenant said of this, and I quote, this case is certainly disturbing. The video shocks the conscience of anyone who looks at this video. 
and it is something that the Dallas Police Department takes seriously. This started a whirlwind of shock and disgust, and it really shed a light on the violence that transgender women in Dallas were experiencing at this time. And there was a lot at this time in that area, and I'm gonna get into it a little bit later, and you're just gonna be like, what the fuck? Like, how is this happening? And nobody was doing anything, doing anything. And after this activist started to speak out and they condemned the apartment complex as a whole. And they also condemned everybody who stood by and watched this happen because she could have literally died. Like an attack like that, she could have died and no one cared to do anything. The mayor of Dallas released the following quote after learning of Malaysia's attack. I am extremely angry about what appears to be mob violence against this woman. Those who did this do not represent how Dallasites feel about our now thriving LGBTQ community. We will not stand for this kind of behavior. A neighbor of the apartment complex, a woman named Olinka, said of the attack, and I quote, I want to say to those who live in the Royal Crest community, Y'all are better than this. This act of mob violence was vicious and uncalled for. Management of the apartment complex released the following statement in response to what happened to Malaysia. We at Royal Crest Apartments are very disturbed by the video of the violent incident that occurred near our property on Friday. We strongly condemn any acts of violence or discrimination. While neither the victim nor the attackers were residents of the property, and the incident appears to have begun with a traffic incident, we are working to obtain all available surveillance video to assist the Dallas Police Department in their ongoing investigation. We are grateful for Dallas Police Department's diligent arrest of the suspect. Our prayers are with the victim, and we will continue to work with law enforcement to prevent violence in our nearby communities. So they were kind of like, listen, <laughs> this happened like next door, but like we weren't really involved, so please stop saying our name when referencing this assault. Malaysia's aunt, her gay aunt, was the first person, one of the first people that she saw after her attack. And she said that Malaysia was just beaten down by this and not even her physical injuries. She said her physical injuries were clearly bad, but it was her soul that was just like wrecked from this. She just felt defeated and I can't even imagine I can't even imagine how she felt at that point, but she said that her and Malaysia just sat there and cried together. Malaysia's friend Jessica said that though the attack at the apartment complex was the attack that got her, you know, got people paying attention to the fact that Malaysia had been hurt, this wasn't the first time that this had happened to her and she was targeted and attacked several times due to her gender identity. Apparently Malaysia, um, her arm, you can see in photos that it was kind of like in a weird position and that's because it had been permanently altered after having several surgeries from being in fights trying to defend herself throughout her life. And her friend Jessica said of all of this, and I quote, she was so tired of getting beaten down, tired of not being able to be who she wanted to be. Leslie McMurray, who is transgender herself and is also the transgender education and advocacy co coordinator at the Resource Center in Dallas, called the attack sickening. She said specifically, and I quote, it's utterly terrifying. You could just feel the energy and the malevolence of the crowd escalate as the violence ensued. And there was no voice standing up saying, stop. There's no reason that our lives are less valuable than someone else's or that we should be someone's punching bag just because we're transgender. Malaysia's father, um, Pierre Booker, said that the people who attacked her were cowards, his quote, and um, to that I say, yes. And he said that due to the attack, his daughter was traumatized, highly traumatized. And he says that he was just so upset and having to sit and watch what happened to his child. And I can't even imagine that sitting back and watching your child be beaten by that many people and having all these people just stand by and watch that sounds horrifying. I would just always be so scared for her and her, her grandma, um, Malaysia's grandma said that, um, she hopes that the people who attacked her become better people. I guess she said that she prays that they learn to accept all people the way that God does. A week after her attack, Malaysia um, attended a rally in Dallas, and this was a rally that was aimed at education and acceptance for transgender human beings in Dallas because of the way 
that they had been treated. And at this point, Malaysia had sort of become like the face for this movement. She didn't like try to become that, but she just did become that because of how publicized her attack was. And she said at this rally that she was just thankful to be alive. She said specifically during this rally, and I quote, this has been a rough week for myself, the transgender community, and also the city of Dallas. This time I can stand before you, where in other scenarios, we are at a memorial. Which that quote right there, it's used in so many articles about what happened in Malaysia. And it, I, I see why, because it is so eerie in hindsight, knowing what ends up happening to her literally just weeks later. She continued saying, quote, this time it was me. Next time it could be someone else close to you. Apparently Malaysia was really nervous about being sort of the face for this movement and for speaking out so much. She knew it was the right thing to do, which is why she did it. But it made her nervous because not all the people who assaulted her had even been arrested by this point. There were still the people on the sidelines who had been kicking her in the head that police were trying to, to locate. So she was freaked out thinking that these people were going to see how much she was talking out and be pissed and want to hurt her. And apparently she kept telling her friends that like, someone's going to kill me. These people are going to come back and they're going to kill me. And again, that's just such eerie foreshadowing for her life. Police were able to track down Malaysia's attacker fairly quickly, at least the main attacker, the primary aggressor. They were still canvassing the area looking for leads to try to find the other men who attacked her in the video. But they were able to find um, the main dude, and this was a 29-year-old man named Edward Thomas. When police tracked him down, he was just hanging out at a friend's house. He was chilling not killing and he was hiding out at this house and when he was arrested at this home he was found with an illegal handgun in his possession i think it was stolen so that is not good because clearly this is a violent man based on what we have seen him do to malaysia you know what i mean so he was arrested and he was charged with aggravated assault and when police asked him like why he did what he did like sir please explain yourself what do you have to say for yourself you piece of human shit he said basically that Malaysia was talking smack in his neighborhood and that he could not, he simply could not allow that to happen and that he didn't beat her as bad as he would have quote, a real man. Anyways, he's arrested. His bond is set at $75,000 and two days later, he actually makes bond. So at the time Malaysia was killed, he, was back out on the streets. So naturally, this is the first place that police want to look when investigating her murder. So police tracked Edward Thomas down and they rearrested him because clearly like they had reason to think that he could be involved. He would have reason to be like kind of pissed off at Malaysia. I mean, he's being held um, in jail for something he did to her that she will need to testify for against him to get him put in a jail, right? Like, duh. Duh, Brittany. We can see why they would be looking into this man. So they rearrest him and they actually hold him this time without bond, even though they really didn't have any evidence to suggest he was actually involved in Malaysia's murder. They just thought it was possible. So I thought that was kind of like weird. I mean, I'm for like locking this guy up and throwing away the key because he's a dick, but also like, you know what I mean? Like maybe we shouldn't hold people without bond. I don't know. I don't know how I feel. Now I'm just ignore me. Don't ignore me. Watch the rest of the video, but ignore me right now with this. Cause I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Do you ever feel that way? Like I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Sometimes I just talk to hear myself talk, which is why I have a YouTube channel, I guess. So they arrest him and in investigating him further, they found that he was not the one. He couldn't have been the one who was responsible for Malaysia's death specifically. He couldn't have been the one who committed the crime because at the time he was wearing an ankle monitor so they could look at where he had been. And though he had been at many, uh, un, unallowed, unallowed locations, like places he wasn't supposed to be while he was released, they found that he was not near where Malaysia was killed when she was killed. So bang goes that theory. But just for clarity and just for a little bit of, um, added information to this case, just because he didn't kill Malaysia doesn't mean that he's a good guy. I mean, the attack on her alone is pretty um, evident that he's like kind of a piece of shit. But on top of that, I believe it was in 2021, he was actually rearrested for murder. He shot, he allegedly, I don't think it's 
been prosecuted yet. So he allegedly shot and killed a 41 year old woman named LaShonda Wilson. I guess there was like a fight outside and two of his female friends were involved in this fight. And in the commission of this fight, he shot and killed allegedly this woman, LaShonda. So still a piece of shit, right? Right. And that does show that police were not totally off board and thinking that he was at least capable of killing Malaysia. Oh, also, in case you were wondering about the charges um, against him for the assault on Malaysia and how those were standing, considering now she was dead, the police were, quote, reviewing all available evidence to determine if it would be classified as a hate crime initially, but gender identity at the time that this crime was committed was not covered under Texas's hate crime laws. So after four hours of deliberation, he was found guilty of a lesser charge and sentenced to a whopping 300 days in jail including time served, including time served. Can't forget that. So he ended up spending like a wa less than a whopping one year in jail total for beating Malaysia in a mob style attack that could have killed her, but didn't. Can you tell why I am a little salty? Because I am salty here. <laughs> Anyways, Malaysia's funeral was held about a month after her murder, and this was on May 28th, 2019. And her funeral was named Storytime after the Facebook Live um, videos that Malaysia would always do on social media. Her funeral was held at the Cathedral of Hope in Dallas, which is one of the country's largest LGBTQ congregations. And funeral guests made custom shirts for the occasion purple t-shirts with photos of Malaysia and the colors of the funeral were blue and white. Her mother saying these were her favorite colors, though some said her favorite color was pink. Many guests did wear blue and white and Malaysia's casket was blue, as was she in her bejeweled dress, tiara and glittery eyeshadow. I really do think that that was commendable of her family and respectable for them to display her in her casket the way she would want to be, especially since it had been so hard for her mother, um, particularly, at least that's how it's, um, reported that it was so hard for her to accept that her child was transgender. I think that it was big and respectable for them to lay her to rest in the way that she chose to live her life. The fact that Malaysia's transition was hard for her family and the fact that they are clearly learning how to navigate, um, the fact that this is who she really is was evident in the funeral um, and in the pamphlet that was given out at the funeral. You know how pamphlets are handed out at funerals. Well, in the pamphlet, there were photos of Malaysia, photos of her as a woman, as who she really was, as the life that she chose to live. But there were also photos of her included in there before she transitioned, including one of her in her Boy Scout uniform when she was younger. And this decision was called a quote compromise for the family by the person who organized the funeral. And in addition to that, the um, pamphlet and on the front of it, it said beloved son above adored daughter. This wasn't exactly a secret though. Like even during her mother's eulogy, she said that it was difficult for her as a, as a mother to accept that Malaysia was transgender. And I think it's easy from some of our perspective to be like, it's not that hard, right? But we have to remember that we're coming at this from our understanding. You can only understand things from your own perspective and your own life experiences. So we're coming at this from a place of how we were raised, um, the community we lived in growing up and the way we've chosen to live our lives this entire time. So for me, it seems so obvious, like, oh, she's a woman who was just born in the wrong body. Like that's easy for me to see, but that's not an easy thing for everyone to wrap their heads around. And I understand that. And I think that even though we're like, that we understand that and they don't, we need to understand that they are still trying in Malaysia's death to honor who she was as a person. And I think that that's important. Her mother has said that she realizes that her daughter was strong and that she took all these hits through her life and paid the ultimate price with her life to be who she really was and that that was really eye-opening for her. And I know I've just gone off on like a thing right now, but I feel like there's gonna be people that are hard on her parents and her family in the comments for the choices that they've made and the way that they've been. But we do need to remember that we can only form opinions 
based on our life experiences and that most people do not just change overnight, um, but steps in the right direction are important. Anyways, at the funeral, the first few rows were filled with her family, both her biological family and her found gay family. And a lot of these people that were sitting in these first few rows were her gay dads. Her mother said of these men, and I quote, when I couldn't see eye to eye with my baby, they filled the gap. I know what you did for me, and I thank God for that. People came from all over to pay respect to Malaysia. People from New Orleans, Washington, women who had never met Malaysia, but who just saw themselves in her. Fellow transgender women of color who looked at her and realized this could have very easily have been them. And they came to see the woman that they had never met that they still considered a sister. One of these women was a transgender advocate named Tierra Gendi. She showed up wearing a t-shirt that said, quote, silence is violence. And she said of her appearance at Malaysia's funeral, and I quote, we're not as visible as we need to be. We need to show up for each other and show that we exist. Also in attendance at Malaysia's funeral was actually the mayor, which was like a pretty big deal, but activists were like, listen, that's cool and all. Thanks for coming. Your support is great, but what we really need is some real action. Some more um, transgendered, transgendered women of color. I don't know what that voice was, um, but so that more transgendered women of color are not murdered. Back to the investigation. So now that police have realized that their number one suspect is not the killer of Malaysia, they have to start booking it into high gear to figure it out. Like, sorry, Mr. Policeman, sucks to suck. You're gonna have to work a little bit harder. Um, so they started looking into Malaysia's final day to determine what had happened to her. Now, the last person to see Malaysia alive besides her killer was one of Malaysia's family members. This was her gay dad named TJ. And TJ said that it was a total normal, total normal, totally normal conversation. She called him and asked like when he got off work, if she would be willing to drive her, if she, you know, if he would be willing to drive her over to the block. And he says that it was totally fine. He did that. He picked her up. He drove her over. When he dropped her off though, he said that she grabbed his face and she kissed him on the cheek and that this wasn't a totally normal thing for her to do. And that that was the last thing she did before getting out of his car. And that that thought sticks in his head because it did seem out of character for her. Now, the block was an area where men would go to look for transgender women to pay for sex work. And Malaysia was an escort who worked at the block. Now, Malaysia had been hurt before doing this work. A man had hit her in the head with like the butt of a gun during, during one of her um, encounters. But this was the type of job that she could do while being free to be totally herself. This was a job where it was an easy way to make money. And it was also a job where her presence, her gender identity was expected. You know what I mean? So she wasn't going to deal with some of the harassment that she had dealt with at traditional jobs because she had had traditional jobs up until she was 21. She had worked in an array of other areas. She had even worked at a fast food place, for instance, but while she was working there, somebody had literally thrown urine on her. So Malaysia decided to do sex work as a job. And for um, clarity, this is actually shockingly common um, for transgender women to end up doing sex work. Now, I have no issue with this. I don't know if I've ever expressed my opinion on sex work, but as long as it's between two consenting adults and it doesn't involve anyone being, then I'm all for it. Do you get your money? I have no issue with this, but a lot of transgender women are essentially forced into doing this type of work and it's considered to be survival sex work. Transgender people are three times as likely to be unemployed and for black transgender Americans specifically, many of them are living in poverty. So due to a lack of employment options because of their gender identity and some who are transitioning facing high as fuck medical costs, many transgender women engage in sex work just to get by. And Malaysia being a black transgender woman did just that. She worked at the block and she liked working there specifically because at least the people she worked with, the girls who worked the area, looked out for each other. They watched out for each other. They paid attention to who the girls went off with. They paid attention to the cars the girls got into. And this ended up being very helpful in solving Malaysia's murder because 
police were able to get a description of the car that she had gotten into that night. It was found that Malaysia had been picked up in a light colored Lincoln from the 28 block of Lago Street in Dallas at about 3.25 a.m. So within 20 minutes from being picked up, she was shot. Police got a warrant for Malaysia's cell phone record since her cell phone wasn't with her when her body was found. And they found in doing that, that her phone was being used after she was killed and likely being used by the person who had killed her. So police searched the area where Malaysia's phone was pinging to see if they could find a vehicle in the area that matched the description of the vehicle that Malaysia, Malaysia, Malaysia was seen getting into the night she was killed. So they're driving around and this is when they spot it. They spot a light colored Lincoln parked in front of an apartment complex. And when they figure out who it belongs to, they find that this vehicle actually belongs to a man who was already in jail at this time. He had been arrested by this time. And this was a 33 year old man named Kendrell LeVar Lyles. Now at this point, Kendrell had been arrested for committing what? Two other murders. Now this is the point where this case is going to get a little bit confusing, but I'm going to try to make it as clear as possible for you. Kendra Lyles was arrested about two weeks after Malaysia's murder for a murder he committed on May 22nd, which was four days after Malaysia's murder. So apparently Kendra Lyles had gone on a little bit of a killing spree. So on May 22nd, 2019, police responded to a report of gunshots. When they arrived at the location, they found a woman named Letitia Grant in really bad shape, but still alive. So they transported her to a hospital where she later died. The next day, police responded to reports of gunshots at an auto zone. And when they arrived, they found a man named Kenneth Chichaki, I believe is how you pronounce his last name, Chichaki, Kenneth Chichaki, lying on the ground in the parking lot, also in bad shape. And he was transported to the hospital where he too died of his injuries. Now, initially, I don't believe police had any real suspects um, for these two murders, or at least I did not see it in the police reports that they did. But fortunately, the police got lucky when two weeks later, a witness called in with some information and this information made their ears perk up because it was information that only the killer or someone who had spoken to the killer would have had. Apparently, Lyles had been going around and telling people that he was the one who had shot and killed Letitia. And he must have thought he was among friends and that he could like openly say whatever he wanted. But somebody fortunately had listened to that and been like, well, that's kind of fucked up and called and told police. And I think that that's great. Like, first off, good for you, witness. This person's being kept anonymous, probably for their protection, but good for you, witness. It's good to, you know, hear about things like this and come to police. I know that people do be saying that snitches get stitches, but maybe snitches are a good thing. Maybe snitches don't get stitches. Maybe snitches are not bitches. Okay. I figured it out. It's snitches turn in bitches. Put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Anyways, when confronted with this information, of course, Kendrell tried to deny that he was involved. He said that yes, he was in the area, but he had not been the one to kill Letitia. But fortunately, police were able to get his cell phone records. And when they looked at the cell phone records, they found that not only was he clearly like it was clear that he was involved because he and Letitia were talking, 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 mm -hmm. up until the murder, up until the moment, Jesus, that she was killed. And then it showed that their phones were together. They were talking, talking, talking. She was killed. And then all of a sudden radio silence. That doesn't look good, sir. Now, if that wasn't bad enough for Lyles, police were also able to get access to his Facebook account. And in the Facebook account, they saw that him and Kenneth Chichaki, Chichaki, were speaking and they were speaking through a page um, called Cush, Cush Out Kenny. That, this part doesn't matter. That part, I mean, it matters a little bit. Anyways, they're talking on Facebook and they're arranging a drug deal. That's what was going on. Apparently Lyles sells something drug related for, for a career, for a profession. And Kenneth was trying to partake and said um, refreshments. Okay. Um, so they're talking, they're talking back and forth and Lyle's is kind of telling him like, Hey, there better not be any funny business, sir, because I recently had a bad experience and I don't want to go through that again. Recently had a bad experience. Recently he killed Letitia. Anyways. So they're talking and they're talking up until six minutes before Kenneth was shot. And then all of a sudden again, radio silence. Now, again, if that wasn't bad enough, I'm telling you, the evidence is just stacking against Kendra Lyle's. It's Wiles. Wiles. It's Wiles. 
It's wild. Another witness came forward with information on Kenneth's murder as well. Now, I don't know if this was the same witness because they are keeping it anonymous. And I know that there's more than one witness in this case, so it's possible there was, this is a separate incident. But the witness came forward and said that at the time that Lyles killed Kenneth, she was actually with him and she had no idea this was going to happen. Apparently she had been at a laundromat and she had ran, ran into Kendra Lyles at said laundromat. And the two were like, yo, what's up friend? Let's go smoke some weed together. So they head off to drive and smoke together. And when they're together, they're parked in a parking lot, the auto zone parking lot, um, which I'm assuming Kendra told her where to go and didn't tell her what they were going to be doing there. Or so she says, um, that's when Kenneth pulls up. Kendrell gets out of her car to go meet up with Kenneth and Kenneth kind of leans in her window to like talk to her. And all of a sudden Lyles just shoots him and she's like, what the fuck? And she puts the car in reverse and she gets the hell out of Dodge. So Lyles, Kendrell, Kendrell Lyles. Apparently I'm going to bounce back and forth between his first and his last names to keep it super confusing for you. Keep you on your toes. Make sure you're paying attention. Anyways, he is arrested for these two murders. He's in custody for these two murders when police connect him to Malaysia's murder through the description of his vehicle, a white or white, no, light colored Lincoln. But wait, there's more. Now there's a connection, a witness statement that connects him to Malaysia's death because a witness came forward saying that Lyles frequented the area, the block where Malaysia was picked up because he often went there to look for sex work. And if that wasn't enough, okay, so we have the description of the car. We have a witness statement that he would go to pick up sex workers in the exact location that Malaysia worked as what? A sex worker. We also have um, Malaysia's cell phone records, remember, because her cell phone wasn't found with her and was presumably with her killer. Well, when they look at her cell phone records, they see that her phone and Lyle's phone are together at several locations, including the location where Malaysia was picked up and the location where Malaysia the location where Malaysia was killed. So Kendrell Lyles is arrested and he's charged with three counts of murder and held without bail. And what's super wild here among all the wildness is that this guy from all reports had no criminal record, none whatsoever. So what caused him to commit these three murders out of nowhere? Um, no one knows. Even the Dallas police say that his motives are unknown. Now, when the news of Lyles arrest came out, Malaysia's family was going through it, as I'm sure you can imagine. Like, that would be so difficult to have your child killed um, after everything she had gone through. And they were really surprised when they found out who it was because Malaysia seemingly did not know Kendrell. And Malaysia was the type to keep her circle small. So her family was convinced that whoever killed her was somebody who knew her. Like they were blown away that it was like a complete stranger, essentially, because they said that because of everything she had been through with her life, she was kind of apprehensive of strangers. Um, I don't know if maybe they did not know about her work situation or if maybe they were in denial about her work situation, but they said because she was targeted everywhere she went, she was pretty apprehensive about newcomers. Her aunt was overwhelmed with the news of her murder. Um, she was even apprehensive and questioned if Lyles was really the shooter because again, she was very surprised that it was somebody who didn't know her and her aunt, her name is Quan, Quan Booker. Her aunt Quan said of his arrest, and I quote, if this is the one that killed my niece, I want to talk to him myself. I want to be in the courtroom and I want to ask him why. Now, Malaysia's father was hoping very much that his daughter wasn't targeted due to being transgender. Um, he said that he didn't believe that this was a hate crime right off the bat and that he really, really hoped that his child wasn't targeted. But as more information came out after he was arrested, it started to seem that it was more likely that this was the case because though he had been arrested for three murders and that only Malaysia was transgender of these three, he was now being looked into as a person of interest in the murder of another transgender woman. On June 1st, less than a week after Malaysia's murder, Chanel Lindsay, a caretaker at the Alpha Home Health Center, who also happened to be a black transgender woman, well, her body was found floating in a lake north from where Malaysia was killed and she too was murdered. And she was the fifth transgender woman murdered in Dallas in the last four years. So we have Malaysia Booker, who was 23 when she was murdered and she was found face down shot in the street. We have Chanel Lindsay, who was 26 and she is found floating in White Rock Lake. 
We then have Brittany White, who is 29, and she was found dead in a car near an elementary school. We have Carla Patricia Flores Pavon, who is 26, and she was found strangled to death in her apartment in May of 2018. And last, we have Shade Schuler, who is 22, and she was found dead in a field from gunshot wounds in 2015. On top of these four murder victims, there was also another victim whose identity has not been released, and apparently she survived her attack. What happened to her is apparently she was stabbed several times and left for dead, but she survived her attack, and she was 26 years old. And I guess she gave police a description of the man who attacked her, but police have not released this description publicly. All of these women, with the exception of the survivor, since her identity is anonymous, so I have no idea what she looks like or anything about her, but all of the murdered women were transgender women of color. So it led people to speculate whether or not there was a serial killer on the loose who was targeting transgender women of color and whether or not Kendra LeVar Lyles was this man. In two of the cases, the women were picked up at the same intersection, so they presumably got into the car with their killer and were then killed. And in another of the scenarios, the woman was found dead in her car and she had presumably picked up her killer. Now, at this time, police are looking into Kendra Lyles in connection with Chanel's murder, but they said that Chanel's murder wasn't being, there wasn't enough evidence to say that it was linked to the other murdered women, okay? But before Chanel's body was even found, police were trying to see if Malaysia's murder, Brittany White's murder, and the attempted murder of the unnamed woman, the woman who was stabbed and left for dead but survived, they were trying to see if those three were connected. So clearly they thought that something was going on here, and they even reported that the cases did have similarities. They had even called in the FBI for assistance in these crimes because they thought that the murders could have been motivated by hate. When police were asked if they were concerned that there was a serial killer in Dallas who was targeting transgender women, the police said that they didn't have any evidence to support that. But in the same breath, they did say that they wanted the community to stay vigilant and to come forward with any information they, could, they, they had that could help solve these murders. They also said that investigators had met with local LGBTQ leaders to ensure members of the community know who they can contact if they feel unsafe. Now, it did turn out that Lyles was not responsible for Chanel's murder. A 24-year-old man named Ruben Alvarati was found guilty of the first-degree murder of Chanel in 2021. It turns out that Ruben had picked Chanel up to have sex near White Rock Lake, but when he realized that she wasn't biologically female, he strangled her to death with his belt. He says that it was, it was self-defense that he had to defend himself because she had attacked him. But, I mean, he did strangle her with his belt, and he was found guilty of first-degree murder, so... Now, I do not know how Chanel's death not being connected to the others affects the others' investiga investigations? The investigations into the others' murders, because Chanel's murder was being looked at in connection with Malaysia's, and Malaysia's was being looked at as being connected to Brittany White's and also the woman who was stabbed and survived. So I don't know if now police are thinking that there isn't a serial killer and that these are still, and that these are isolated incidents. Um, from what I can see, they are still, as, as far as I can see, besides Malaysia's, they're still unsolved, all of them. Um, so is there a serial killer out there that is targeting transgender women of color, or are there just that many separate absolute murderous douchebag monsters that are just killing transgender women. I don't know which is scarier to me. As of 2019, Texas leads the nation as the state with the most transgender human beings being murdered. And half of those, so Texas has the most, and half of the murders of transgender human beings in Texas happened in Dallas. And that's where Malaysia was murdered. So at this point, um, Kendra LeVar Lyles has been arrested, and from what I can see, that's where the case stands. I know that trials can sometimes take forever to get started, and since he was being looked at in additional murders, at least he was at one point, I could see it taking even longer. And Pierre Booker, uh, Malaysia's father, has said that the arrest has brought him some peace, um, but that he's, you know, He's still not going to get his kid back, that his child will be gone forever. It's, it's so sad. And that in the beginning, he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, he couldn't do anything because he was like grieving the loss of his child. It's just horrible. And he said of his daughter's murder, 
end I quote. I just never thought in a million days I'd be burying one of my kids. I wanted my kids to bury me. And I feel like a lot of parents can, can relate to that. Like a lot of parents have to feel that way after they lose a child because burying your kids isn't natural. That's not the way that the world's supposed to go. That's not the way the cycle of life is supposed to work. You're supposed to live, have kids, die, your kids bury you, and then the cycle continues. So to lose a kid is just horrible. And I remember in one of my favorite TV shows, Six Feet Under, they actually like touch on this a little bit. And I don't know how many videos I'm going to reference Six Feet Under in because it feels like I've done it a lot, but like, it's just a good show. And they have a lot of insightful things to say about death. And that's what we talk about here, you know? And in the show, um, one of the characters named Brenda, she says of, of a parent losing a child. And I quote, if you lose a spouse, you're called a widow or a widower. If you're a child and you lose your parents, then you're an orphan. But what's the word to describe a parent who loses a child? I guess that's too fucking awful to even have a name. The Malaysia Booker Foundation was created to help support transgender human beings as well as their families. The Malaysia Booker Foundation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing housing, advocacy, emotional support, counseling, employment resources, and training to transgender women. They strive to quote, inspire, nurture, and provide a safe haven to this community by addressing acts of violence, homelessness, sex work, and suicide. And Malaysia's mother, Shante Houston, is the executive director. And I think it's so rad that her family is doing that, that they're trying to help people who have found themselves in similar circumstation, circumstations, circumstances that Malaysia found herself in, especially since getting there was such a journey for her mother to now be the executive director is just very, it gets me right here. Growth is just so important. And it's sometimes even more impressive than just having the inherent learned, raised goodness to be able to see where you have shortcomings and become better is commendable. And it should be commendable because it's not an easy thing to do. And I just think it's so rad and such a beautiful thing for them to do this in their daughter's honor to help with mental health for these women and also to help these women get employment, safe employment. Leslie McMurray, who we discussed earlier, she's the one who is transgender herself and also the um, transgender education and advocacy coordinator. Jesus, it's such a hard bleh, to get out of my mouth. It doesn't, my mouth doesn't work with those big words. <laughs> But she said specifically of this, and I quote, we have to offer black trans women something better than sex work to get by because they deserve more than that. They deserve equal opportunity, equal employment. They should be able to work as administrative assistants and airline pilots and physicians assistants and anything that their time and their talent will take them to do. And I gotta say, I 100% agree. Unless these women want to be in sex work, then 100% go off, do your thing, have at it. I don't know, like do it, I don't care. But if this is something that people are being forced into, if this is something that people have to just so they can be able to eat, that's when there's a problem because people should not have to put themselves in danger just to get by. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, of course, thank you for hanging out and remembering Malaysia Booker with me today. What happened to Malaysia is so horrible. That last month of her life, I can't even imagine what that was like to go through what she went through, to go through that mob style attack, to have that many people just watching as you getting, as you got beat, to have that many people watch as you could have very easily died, right? To just be subjected to that. I can't imagine what that was like for her emotionally, not even just physically, but to see that many people who wouldn't be willing to help you had to have been heartbreaking. So to go through that and survive, okay? And then just a few weeks later to be murdered and for the two to be unrelated, for the two to be unrelated. So there's just that much hate targeted at you specifically. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine that just, uh, it breaks my heart. And I will keep watching for updates on Malaysia's case, um, updates on the trial. I'm very interested to see what kind of sentence Lyles gets. I'm very interested to see if he's connected to the other crimes. And if he's not, I'm very interested to see how these play out because these women deserve justice as well. 
And now considering everything I've told you, I'm going to ask you the question of the day. And that is, what do you think the motive was for killing Malaysia? Do you think she was killed for her gender identity? Or do you think that that was unrelated? Um, do you think that there is a serial killer in Dallas that's targeting women, transgender women of color? Or do you think there's just that many unrelated murderous fucking assholes who are killing transgender women? I guess that's not really a question of the day. These are the questions of the day. So please leave your answers down below for me. And anyways, guys, that completes this video. So please leave down below, leave down below. Please leave me down below any case suggestions that you have that you'd like to see me cover. I've been covering a lot of um, subscriber suggestions recently because I like looking into the cases that you suggest because sometimes you open my eyes to more cases that just need a little more light shined on, shined on them like this one. I had never even heard of Malaysia's case and that's crazy to me because it's um, atrocious. And so this, obviously this video shows you that if you leave me a suggestion, I will look into what you suggest. I can't speak English, but anyways, I look into your cases cause I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new video every single week and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, you can follow me on social media. It's all listed down below for you. I have a Facebook page. I have an Instagram and I have a Twitter and a Facebook group. I would suggest following me there because there's a lot of video shorts and stuff and it's pretty cool. You get like more content. <laughs> yeah, more content. And also there's a link to my merch store where you can get shirts like this one that says, and I quote, because you guys give me shit about saying, and I quote so many times in a video. So I made a shirt because I'm hilarious. Uh, and I want to say one more thank you to Dossier for wanting to work with me on this video because that's pretty tight. We've been working together for a year now. We just hit the year anniversary, the day that I'm filming this. And I think that that's pretty cool um, that they support what I do and that you are supportive of them supporting what I do. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. At least be better than pretty much most of the people that we discussed in this video. Okay, be better than them. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.